with my husband in the areas of budget and project management. And now he is a senior fellow at George Mason University. So today, well, I'll let him lecture tell you what he's going to lecture on. Okay, thank you. Um, we have four major areas I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover them very briefly. Russian, but also flown in Ukrainian as well. I'll show you that in a 
that. Anyway, one of the things I want to tell you about is that, that for many of you, the only two things people notice about NASA. One, I think, or notice the, the missions with, with astronauts and cosmonauts. And the other thing, um, which I'll address in a little while, we have many, many um, scientific explorations to the planets and to the stars. This is a this uh, mission. Like again, is fairly typical in that it does have an international crew. During the early stages of the U.S. space program, all of the astronauts were military test pilots for several reasons. One of which there was a high risk involved. Um, and over the last um, since the space shuttle was launched, there have been many uh, many international astronauts. The trend is continuing. One of the reasons it's continuing is that no nation alone can afford space exploration. It needs to, need to be cooperative. And um, it's better that people are developing their technology, nations are developing their technology, working together rather than working on weapons of destruction. So this is, I think, very positive. Um, to, to bring home the point about international, here's a list that I've proposed to go through all of it. But you'll see these are the people who, in fact, have flown on space shuttle missions. And the first person, if I can point to it, would be down here, would be 1983. Ulf uh, Mirabold from uh, Germany was, I believe, the first uh, foreign astronaut. And you'll see there are many, many. Ten years ago, I think a lot of us would have found it difficult to believe that we would be flying cosmonauts. Although we did have a joint mission with the Soviet Union in 1975. It was, it was called the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project, and in that mission we did link up um, using an Apollo capsule and a Soyuz capsule in space. So there was a precedent, but then uh, the Cold War um, got colder, and there was a lot less cooperation between the United States and so in you know. um, here's just some more. Um, you'll find. Uh, I should I should point out if you look at the last the bottom of the page here that we we were beginning to fly a fair number prior to the Challenger accident and then in the, after the Challenger accident uh, it was several years before we flew the national cruise again. Um, again, the, there was a question of. Um, safety and uh, oh, that was a concern. But um, and this list is probably this, is, this list is a little bit old, so it's probably more people today. Um, this is just to make a, a point, there's the space shuttle. It's a marvelous piece of technology. It is um, um, except for the Challenger accident, it's been remarkably uh, it has, it's had an excellent safety record. There have been some problems just as you would find in an aircraft, but uh, they, they have not, not been anything um, uh, really serious. The, just for your information, I'm sure maybe some of you do not know this, this is the orbiter. It has three main engines, and these are the two solid rocket boosters at the end. Uh, uh, at the bottom of the slide there. These things are very dangerous. They're like gigantic uh, firecrackers. Once you light them, you cannot stop them. Uh, but they are needed to, to provide the thrust to get you to work. You need an awful, awful lot of, of energy to get this looking like a plane. It does land like a plane, as you don't know. Orbit. These two solid rocket boosters, in conjunction with the main engine, utilizing the fuel for this external tank, this brownish kind of rust colored uh, tank in the middle, is that all that does is carry liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, to feed these three main engines. When the solid rocket boosters drop away after about two minutes, two minutes and 20 seconds, then it goes another five or six minutes just to the thrust of the three main engines. So, you watch a ship space shuttle go up, and like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's a marvel. Um, the, all, the, the main reason it's, it was developed is the shuttle means going back and forth. So that's what it was designed to do. Originally, it was planned to have more shuttles, more and more flights, but 
again, due to budget limitations and uh, other factors, it, is not, it has not been flown more than six, eight times a year. Could go to 12 or 15 if, if, if the money were available. The, the shuttle is, when you stand up close to it, is enormous because the payload bay, it's about the size of a DC-9, uh, an aircraft uh, somebody may have flown on, but to think that goes in orbit is, is kind of takes your breath away. The payload bay, which is the heart of the shuttle, is 15 feet wide by 60 feet long. They can hold a, a lot of, um, of items to take to orbit. I'll explain to you in a few minutes that one of the things that's happened over the last several years is that we're able to develop a lot of, of um, a lot of payloads can be carried on smaller rockets than space shuttles. And here's what you've been looking at. Uh, the news, M uh, Mir, there's a space shuttle again, and here is the Mir. And the Mir in, is a uh, very old, it's about 14 years old now. It was never designed to, to last this long, so it had many, many problems with it. But it has done some uh, useful scientific work. It's like an automobile, you keep too long. The longer you keep it, the more repairs you need. But it's been very useful for, uh, as a vehicle for cooperation with the Russians. One problem, the tremendous problem that the Mir is an example of that, the Russians do not have any money to speak of to, to fund their, any of their programs. And, and the space program in particular has fallen to particular, uh, hard, particularly fallen on hard times. Um, in the next couple of years, um, you'll see the space station. To give you an idea of what we're talking about, the Mir, if you look at the space shuttle, it's the same size. The space shuttle is about a DC-9. It's about, uh, I think, 180 feet long and about 79 feet from, from ground to tail. So that's a pretty good size vehicle. Next to the, it's, it, it is, but the Mir is not that much larger than the space shuttle. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the Russians launched the first piece building block of the International Space Station, and um, you'll see in a moment, um, it is um, almost as long as the Washington Monument. I mean, you, when you see it, you'll be able to see it from the ground. Actually, you can see, uh, and Ms. Gibbler and I have done this before, if you know where to look in the evening, you can see a satellite storm in the head if they're large enough. Just after sunset and just before sunrise, you can see them. Because the sun, just like we're in here, the sun is reflecting off the object. You know where to look, you can see it. This thing will be big enough to be much easier to see than other than uh, other things. We've seen the mirror and the shuttle before. But again, you have to know where to look. Now, several points about the space station. This is gonna, it's gonna be in the news over the next several years. That's the size. It's 350 feet long. And about eight and eighty, and it says uh, two hundred ninety feet high. So that's like for those of you who are you know a little bit about American football, two hundred ninety feet high is about the length of an American football field. So it's it's a, it's a large. It'll be a large piece of structure. A lot of it, in fact, is taken up with the solar arrays, those dark uh, rectangular objects, which are designed to collect energy from the sun. We need to spend that much time on the hardware, but it's called the International Space Station for a reason. These are the things it's going to do. I want to write all that down. But again, it gets back to long-term exploration to provide benefits to people on Earth. If you remember, the initial NASA charter was to bring benefits to, to, to all mankind. And, and again, over the last 15, 20 years, we've been doing more in the international arena. Now, international, it is, has a multitude of countries. Um, the colors are designed to show you which countries. The teal, the, the solar arrays, in fact, are the United States. Russia would be green. Europe is pink. Japan is orange. Or to be yellow. Canada is orange. It's hard to see. But you'll just, if you look on the left side, you'll see that there are several countries involved. Europe involved, and Europe is, is 12 countries in Europe, probably more, because Ukraine is now going to get involved in the space, space station as well. So again, it's a political, a scientific, a uh, financial uh, reason for having many countries involved. Now, that was a quick pass through on where we are today relative to human exploration. Now, 
want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about the uh, third item we have, which is how NASA chooses its missions. NASA has missions in four areas. And one of them I want to make sure you don't forget, because people... The first one, again, is aeronautics, dealing with aircraft. Uh, NASA has had a charter on that, as I showed you, since 1915, during the middle, actually, of World War I. Uh, and it continues today. Much of the, uh, much of the uh, advances made in aircraft engines and structures have, in fact, the basic research for that has been done at NASA laboratories. By both NASA personnel and people from the industry. Now, the second, third, and fourth, space science, human exploration, and Earth resources, um, those are the fundamental areas of, of space exploration. And the question is, how does NASA choose these? Well, you do several things. One is you look at the resources available. A resource available is a space shuttle or some other means to get to Earth orbit if that's where you have to go. Um, the other thing is there are only so many shuttle flights, for example. So what you do is you have what we call peer uh, group reviews. These are groups of scientists who would be astrobiologists, chemists, physicists, uh, medical doctors, and they see if they could put together a mission, for example, on the space shuttle that could accommodate several of these uh, scientific needs at the same time. One of the things I, I do want to point out, and that may not show up in the subsequent slide, is the Earth resources. Um, much of what's happened, uh, much of, many of us don't realize that in fact that the, uh, both in the communication satellites and in the improvements in weather satellites and things like that, that we have been able to improve our quality of life in both areas. For example, uh, weather, weather forecast in this case. Uh, it may not be perfect in, in telling you whether it's 72 degrees today or 65 degrees, but it certainly has given people advance warning on, on major catastrophes, hurricanes, and things like that. Um, Earth resources also, it's, it's a very quiet, quietly going on, but there's been, met, there's been quite, quite a considerable amount of mapping done on, on Earth resources. There have been, uh, due to the space program, we've been able to track the, uh, the depletion of the ozone level, which is a level that protects us. It's a, it's a very thin level, level layer of the atmosphere, very high, like an eggshell, protects us from the harmful effects of the sun. Bill has done quite a bit of that. Um, now what I want to talk about is, is some of the scientific missions that we do. Again, um, I just tried this yesterday. I like the idea that we, th these are shuttle, the, these are mission patches, which each space mission has its own little patch design. And um, these here, this is, this is doing some astrophysics.
And without going through all of these uh, little programs, there are virtually, every, not virtually, every planet in the solar system has been and will be, continue to be explored. Um, the one that hasn't been explored much because it's so erratic is Pluto to the far left. It's the furthest, it's the furthest of the uh, and it's in a diff different plane uh, than the rest of the planets. Several large planets, some of you might know this already, in fact, are primarily gas. The outer planets are all mostly, uh, they're, not, they're not solid, uh, or semi-solid. And the, um, but in the, sci in, in the science area, once a budget is allocated for science, say, as opposed to human exploration, we're all, they're always competing funds, just like in your own budget, whether you get a bottle of wine, I guess, or three loaves of bread, it's, it's a trade-off sometimes. But um, two years ago, or a year and a half ago, you'll probably remember the Mars Pathfinder, the very little uh, satellite that went to, to Mars. So that's being followed by a whole series of satellites, which will go up over the next several years. Um, just for information, the Mars satellite, the one, the little thing that was that was going around the surface of Mars, uh, Sojourner Truth was the name given to the thing. It was about this big, maybe a little longer, it was that big, so it's hard to tell. It was like a model in a movie. It was, but it did a lot of very useful work. So again, Ms. Gibbon was asking about how NASA chooses the missions. You work on something that's worthwhile studying, worthwhile devoting your time, energy, and money, and then but you cannot do that without, a, again, a comprehensive plan. And this kind of, in a very general way, shows you the comprehensive plan that, that we have for exploring the planets. And this is not something that's going to stop. It's been going on for 50 years, and it'll continue, or excuse me, 30 years, and it'll go on for as long as we can. Eventually, uh, humans will probably attempt to reach uh, several of the uh, several of the, of the, the planets. The most likely candidate, obviously, is Mars. And there is a, a uh, Europa is a moon on, on Saturn that might have something there. Several of the planets and their moons appear to have had some form, possibly in the, in the millions of years ago, some form of, of water or something. Uh, and they were a lot different than they are today. I'm not saying life, but I'm saying there seems to have been something there. That's why we're going back to Mars to, to see that. Um, just as a point of reference, um, when I first went to NASA 30 years ago, I worked in the Apollo program, which you know went to the moon, and uh, there was planning to put up a very aggressive program doing that. But again, due to primarily money, among other things, um, we haven't done that. We have we haven't done as much as we could. I guess one of the points to be made as far as NASA is concerned, NASA could be doing a lot more. It's not a lack of ability, but it's a lack of political will in this country to do that. I mean, there are other priorities. When NASA chooses its missions, it's after NASA's priorities are balanced against welfare, defense, uh, housing, a lot of other uh, you know, priorities within the, in the federal budget. This is an interesting, um, uh, this is the John Glenn mission. The mission was more than just John Glenn. Uh, for those of you who, uh, John Glenn, I, I, would, I think it's safe to say for virtually all the students in the room, uh, was the first American in space. So he was, that happened before, well, not only happened before you were born, but it happened before this gentleman was born. So one of the astronauts, in fact, it wasn't even born when John Glenn went on his, his mission. Uh, uh, 36 years ago. Uh, this is, a, uh, interestingly enough, the seven refers to not only the seven astronauts, it refers to John Glenn's capsule when he went up in a Mercury, a tiny little capsule that is probably, the space he had in that capsule is about the same space you have in your, in your seat right now, except that every part of your body would be touching something, a wall, when he was just squeezed in there. But that's what this symbolizes, the Freedom 7 capsule that he went around the Earth about three times in 1962. Uh, 
he wanted to fly again, obviously, and uh, President Kennedy decided he was too valuable to risk in the space mission. You have to remember, in the very beginning of the space program, uh, they thought it was likely we would probably lose one astronaut through some catastrophe. But in, in Nothing happened in, I mean, no, no catastrophes across the human life in the early programs, although Apollo 13 was certainly an interesting time. Now, for the remainder of the time, I'd like to um, I'd talk about where we're going from here. And uh, with questions within that time or after that time? Huh? Okay, fine. Now, the next millennium, I think it's exciting. Everybody stops, and people who are alive, obviously. You, you always look at the year 2000 or 1900, et cetera, to see where you are. Again, the 20th century, and we have gone from, from Kitty Hawk to the moon. Um, Kitty Hawk was North Carolina, where the Wright brothers uh, launched their aircraft. The Wright brothers' actual business those days was that they had a bicycle shop, so they were not a high-tech firm. Good bicycles. But anyway, um, where we've come has just been astounding. Their flight in, in 1903, the distance of that flight was less than from one wing tip to the other wing tip on a 747. Some of you probably flew one down to this country. So, uh, and then 66 years after the first people, it's called powered flight. People were flying gliders before that without engines, but having an engine actually powered the flight. Uh, 1903. 66 years later, we had people standing on the moon. Uh, today, where are we today? Uh, today, I think, at least in the space arena, you'll get a good idea of where we are going uh, for the next 100 years. So at least, I can't speak the next 100 years, but maybe the next 25 and possibly the next 50. Politics drive a lot of what happens here. Again, um, today there's been a much greater emphasis on Earth. Rather, as far as human exploration is concerned, um, there are some studies, but there's no serious effort toward going back to the moon or going to uh, the planet with people. We do it with robots, small, uh, space, smaller and cheaper spacecraft. One of the things that's interesting, of course, and that we hadn't thought of years earlier, is that if, in fact, people go to, when, when, if, when, and it'll be in the 21st century, people will, in fact, be going back to the moon and, and will be going to Mars. What's interesting to me is that they will come back from the moon and they'll come back from Mars with fuel that was developed from resources on the moon and Mars. They're pretty sure there are some frozen water on the moon below the 12th below their ice cap, and they're reasonably sure, optimistic, that there's the same thing there. So if you have water, you have some other minerals, you can, the, the, uh, you, you can develop, develop. Again, the, the fuel for most of the rocket engines today is hydrogen and oxygen. H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, of course, is what comprises water. So if you have water, you have water, you have lots of things, obviously. You can also, you can also grow your own food. One of the things you're going to do in a space station is, in fact, do that. Uh, and you, boast, you, you, you grow food in a closed environment. The other thing they're doing, they've been running some ground tests on, is they, is they've been recycling water. You can, um, you can actually recycle every bit of water you consume. You can recycle it over and over again. And, so, and they're doing that today. Uh, so again, the focus today is on Earth, Earth resources, what's happened to the environment, what we can do to prevent greater damage to the environment. Um, and, um, and that's a hopeful sign. It's a, it's a, um, for example, the devastations of the rainforest, the, the, um, we have a much greater ability to see what's happening there in the jungles, and, and it's become a, it's become a very uh, controversial uh, political issue. Commercialization, like a brief note of this, I'm doing some work on this today. Uh, the one way to think about what's happening right now with rockets and space ports, just think about airports and airplanes. At the beginning of this century, there were none. After a while, there were some aircraft, some planes, again, in response to World War I. In the initial airmail in this 
this country was delivered by the United States Army. The Army delivered it in their airplanes. What's happened since then is after the federal government had the aircraft and the airfields, they've all been turned over to uh, other authorities, mostly states. Every airport in this country, um, with the possible exception of Dallas and National, which are regional and state and federal, but just say every airport in this country is now owned by a state in some way, manner, or private. It's not owned by the federal government, and airplanes are all, the federal government doesn't own any, does not build any airplanes. Now, in the, in the space arena, uh, the same thing is happening. It's happening right now. The states of Virginia, Texas, California, Florida, in fact, are have building their own spaceports. Now, what they're doing, of course, is the federal government is turning uh, unused uh, facilities over to uh, the states to uh, launch their own. Matter of fact, last January, a, a mission was an unmanned small mission, Pathfinder, was launched to the moon and it was launched by the state of Florida. The state of Florida provided the launch facility and a private company launched that. Um, again, the, uh, as I pointed out over and over again, in doing exploration, there is a lot of international cooperation. There's a lot of international cooperation and competition in launch vehicles. There's a tremendous market for that. Um, and as things, items get smaller and smaller, you do not need as large a rocket to launch them. So uh, that, and that's driving the competition, is driving the price down. So, um, and there's less and less federal subsidy of, of in both this country and, and in other countries. Um, so I think it's a, it's a, it's a positive sign. Now, um, that's today. In what, 14 months? No, 13 months. We'll be in the next century. Technically, we'll be at the end of this century, but I don't want to get into that. Basically, in the year 2000, check your computers on New Year's Day, I guess. Um, 13 months from now, we'll be starting a new century. You'll see lots of things about where we're heading. Um, I think that in the space arena, um, no, no, no question that the moon will be probably the first thing again to develop. And I think what we'll be doing, we, Earth, and I, I'm not really saying the United States, because I think anything we're doing will be cooperative. Uh, the far side of the moon is a perfect place for astronomy. They're going to probably build some very, very large um, telescopes. They don't have to be that large, actually, but they'll be on the far side of the moon. They're sheltered and stable, and they'll be the next generation of Hubble. Hubble Space Telescope is, is, uh, has, been, has been marvelous after um, a difficult start. It has been bringing pictures back uh, from about 12 billion years ago. It's hard to imagine, but that's near what scientists predict has been the beginning of, of um, life or, or what's known as the Big Bang. Bang. I think there will be some human presence on planets, uh, but it will be preceded by a, a very extensive unmanned uh, robots. And again, the robots are, are, uh, are able to bring back a lot of things. Matter of fact, one of the ideas on the uh, uh, another project that I'm somewhat close to, not only are we exploring the planets, we're also exploring the asteroids. Asteroids are, there's an asteroid belt that was on that one uh, uh, figure we showed of, of the solar system, and, um, and periodically asteroids, are, you see the comets that come through, uh, they're pretty spectacular. Uh, Hale Bob, I guess, had come through last year. They're not, it's not an asteroid, but it's more uh, planetary debris or, or fragments of planets uh, from explosions billions of years ago. There will be some nice presence on planets, probably closer to 2050 than to the year 2000. And there'll be exploration of the galaxy. Uh, again, that will be probably the 21st century will be uh, probably absolutely will be by, by robots and we have we have launched rockets and with, with payloads and uh, outside of our solar system to other uh, beyond and uh, the first one was done about 1977 so the exploration has been going on and will continue and I think there'll be a lot of benefits
benefits from it. Um, again, you can never, never forget that space exploration is driven by politics and money, and as well as science. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm open for questions if anyone has any. If you don't ask questions, Ms. Gedlon will reduce your grade by one point. I got a question. Ah, oh, very quick, there you go. Pass. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, what was the lesson of challenge? Challenger? Yes. And, yeah, this, question. and the second one uh, is related with politics and security. In some period of, of the history of the United States, especially on the Reagan administrations, uh, some policymakers said that the will be a star war of oh. NASA. And uh, I, what I'd like to ask you is if you think that in many of the launches or the exploration were, were a security purpose in the United States. Okay, um, I'll let me answer the first one, then I'll try to get to the second one. Challenger, uh, one of the lessons of Challenger has, was Many mistakes were made, and uh, sometimes uh, things are done. Um, when you do things over and over again, you get careless and make a mistake. The fundamental thing, one of the fundamental facts about Challenger was the launch. They have launch rules when you can launch something. You don't launch something that's too cold. Challenger, the space shuttle is not supposed to be launched when it's less than 42 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which should be about, what, 5 degrees centigrade, okay? The temperature on the launch pad that morning was not, was 9 degrees, was, was 9 degrees. So that is what, about, that's uh, about minus 15 degrees centigrade, maybe something like that. So it was, they violated the basic rules they had, okay? Uh, the, uh, there was some evidence that there was a problem with the seal on earlier flights. They did not know what it was. Nobody deliberately launched them. If they, if, 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 if the danger was not realized. Okay. And so after the after the accident itself, um, well, two points. One is there was a lot of feeling with the NASA at the time, and I think it was right. Could have launched a, a shuttle right away uh, with the same design, and it would have worked. Uh, as long as it wasn't less than 42 degrees. As long as the warmer it would be, the, the safer it was. You know, if in your car, you sit in a car, I mean, things, rubber and things like that, the colder it gets, they, 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 they get hard, and they don't, they're not flexible, they don't see it, it's it that simple. And there were a lot of problems with the NASA management, who with the authority. In the military, it's very simple. There's a chain of authority, and that's very straight and very direct, because you, have, you know, in, 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 in military matters, you need that. NASA, it was not quite as direct as it should have been, so that was, that was cleaned up. Now, your second question about um, Star Wars and, and security, and I, I guess you, you mean the, uh, well, one of the things about President Reagan that he did, as far as the Soviet Union was concerned, uh, he directed so much money to be spent on defense and other things that he basically broke the Russian bank. There was no way they could keep up with our spending. Um, I don't know if he had thought that through, but that's exactly what happened. The Star Wars is very different, difficult te technologically. Um, it still is. Um, to do that. I think the problem today, and you'll see this more and more in the paper, is not so much a massive attack by some large superpower, because there is no other superpower, but there are lots of problems with smaller uh, weapons and terrorism, and that's where the focus has gone. So we don't have a Star Wars kind of umbrella, kind of, I guess you'd say a shield umbrella, I guess you'd call it. Uh, uh, but um, I think that, um, so the focus on national focus is different than it was 15 years ago, just like it is in the space program. We were in competition with the Russians. Matter of fact, the reason we got so much money during the Apollo program is the Russians were going to the moon too. 
they would have done it. They wouldn't. Have, I don't know if they would have. They probably would not have done it before the United States. But they had their rocket, their Saturn V rocket, their huge rocket, blew up on a launch pad, killing many of the top scientists and rocket engineers. So they just had to stop it there. But uh, they were trying. So, but I don't know if I answered your question. But with regard to security, it's still a concern. Uh, and matter of fact, in the early 1980s, the Defense Department did fly several missions on the space shuttle, um, and, and they were doing defense experiments and things like that, mostly in communications and observations. So. Okay, he passes now. Next question. Yes, good. The, each nation has a e territory land, not only territory land, but also territorial sea and territorial sky, space. But on the other hand, the international law requires that the space space is for public use, not it's international. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Then I don't know from which the from which the space becomes the space for public use. Then. I mean, okay, you, okay. Let me, let me see if I can try this. Um, if this is a country on Earth, yeah. many of them have a three mile limit or 12 miles, some probably 200 miles. I apologize if any of you have 200 miles. But you have a limit around your ter territory. There's also, um, good question, there's also a, we do not, you know, you cannot fly over sovereign territory. Now I cannot tell you how high that goes. The people trying to fly the balloons, Malcolm for, uh, for, uh, Steve Forbes, and Richard uh, Branson, the, the British, the, the people you occasionally see trying to fly around the world in a hot air balloon. They cannot do that because uh, Iran and several other countries will not allow them to fly over their territory. I don't know how high sovereignty goes. Uh, a practical thing would be to, to say that uh, Please don't take this wrong, but if they can't shoot you down, you probably can do it. And that's what's happened. I mean, if they fly high enough, and it's that's probably 100,000 feet. But they, for years, the, the United States and the Soviet Union had spy planes that would fly higher than that. If you go much higher than 100, 120,000 feet, uh, you're getting into space. Space is, is space is the and, and we have said that there'll be no colonization of the moon or anything under one nation's flag. It's international. So, um, um, and hopefully that'll stay. But that, that's a that's a great question. I'm not sure what height it would be, but my suspicion is you cannot fly an airplane through somebody else's kind of airspace. But there's satellites going overhead all the time. There are hundreds of satellites up there. Okay. How much money do the NASA handle you? Not enough, but uh, <laughs> it's actually much smaller than most people realize. It's about, I'm not sure what it is, I'd say about 12 to 13 or 14 billion dollars. Billion dollars, that's a lot of money, I understand, okay? But not with, it's only, a, it's less than 1% of the federal budget. It's very, very small. Uh, the Defense Department, for example, in, in one time, the United States Defense Department had 25 times as much money as NASA did. Matter of fact, the Defense Department had more in their space budget than NASA did. That was during the Cold War again. So it's, it is, um, it's very, the money is very public. People see where it is. And, but most people think it's a lot more than it is. Uh, it comes down to, uh, you know, it's like I said, 12 to 15 billion dollars. It's, it hasn't grown much. It, NASA's budget hasn't developed, and that's part of this other presentation I usually do, hasn't um, really grown um, much at all. It sometimes doesn't keep up with inflation. They do less, and, that, and that's why we, that's for the last 30 years. The reason we haven't, we NASA hasn't done as much as it was technically capable of doing is there hasn't been money. The money is not there if the public doesn't want to support it. One way I describe the support for our space program, and probably other countries' space programs as well, it's very broad, very wide. Everybody says that it's wonderful. That's very, very thin. It's not deep. They're not firmly committed. You can make an argument, I think, and I don't spend all the time on this either, that much 
of what's been done in space, in fact, has been a benefit down here on Earth. The other point is, there hasn't been one dollar has ever been spent in space. Every dollar is spent here somewhere. So, um, you think about that. There's no dollars on the moon, except for some hardware that's left there, but we haven't spent any money there. So, it, it, and it's not large enough, NASA is not large enough to drive an economy. I mean, General Motors or Toyota or Mitsubishi or Daimler Benz, they're all, you know, they're all bigger than NASA is. Na NASA has about uh, 17,000 people. Uh, and uh, again, the Space Center that is in about $15 billion, more or less, uh, the annual budget. Um, I'm not working that anymore, so I'm not exactly sure, but that gives you an idea. The defense budget, for example, is like 20, excuse me, 250 to 270 billion. Our human re uh, health and human services, which are our social services budget for the federal government, is bigger than that. So, you know, you take those two, uh, those two departments, and much of the federal government, by the way, much of the, get off the track, it, there's very little, relatively little, the U.S. federal budget that is what's called discretionary funding. Most of it is welfare payments, which is called transfer payments, loans and things, things like that, interest payments, so it's fixed. It's like you're, you're paying for a car, you've got to pay that every month. So you're, what you have left to spend each month is less and less. So NASA is one of the larger pieces of the discretionary part of the federal budget, but that's not very large. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm going to pass too. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to express it. I'm kind of you know, see when we do step. So what, what's your time on? Uh, it, it's it's very small steps. What we're doing on we're going to we're going to do the the, the solar system and the moon uh, over the next next 20 to 30 years, and then ex at the same time if you do them all sort of together in you know, different tracks or different programs. What you learn about the development of the moon and the planets, the nine planets we have, including the Earth, leads you to your ability to go ahead and, and, and do something outside of the solar system, particularly with the Milky Way. I mean, the nearest stars are about five light years away, which is still considerable. So it, 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 the challenges are immense. But, but we, what we usually do is you send out what they call probes, unmanned probes, and then you see what comes back if there's anything interesting. That's what they're doing. You know, if something came back from Mars now, they find that there, in fact, is water, which I think if they're looking in the right place, they may find something. They matter. In Houston, they think they've already found something that, in fact, indicates there was water. There's a meteorite that came in, and they've been studying it for years. So it's not 100% sure, but that most scientists are pretty sure there is. If you find that, then you turn around and you put more effort. If, if you know there is a, a probability or a better possibility of something happening, like finding water or some resources, then they'll spend more effort on doing that. But it's inevitable. Uh, people ask, why do you go, why are we in space? Why do you explore? A couple of reasons. It's, it's, a, because it's there. That's a, that's a smart answer, but that's not. But that's partially true. In other words, if you don't if you don't explore, you stagnate, you don't grow. Any society has to do that. And uh, the United States, for example, speaking just for the United States, is only going to compete internationally with high tech things. And, and, and the developed nations, I shouldn't say just the United States, all developed nations. The seven the European nations, Japan, and the United States, the developed nations. Uh, cannot compete labor-wise with, with the third world underdeveloped countries on cost. So you have to keep you have to keep moving forward. And, and, and this is clearly an area we're moving forward on. By, by the way, we're moving forward in some areas so fast it's, it's unbelievable. Your personal computers today are better than the original computers we got the space shuttle. You know, it's just that's how things are happening. Uh, you know, so we Matter of fact, what the astronauts now do, instead of using some of the wired stuff, they have laptops. <laughs> but they're faster and better, they just work really well, so why not do that? They don't take up any weight in space. So. I mean, nobody takes up weight in space. It's space. Well, the problem you have with the space shuttle is on the ground, is space. There's not a lot of space. In the cabin, there's not a lot of space because the bulk of the space shuttle, in fact, is empty. It's a cargo bay for the scientific satellites and things you launch into space. So I think, you know, I think in your lifetime, and I mean, I'm not, but in your lifetime, I, you're going to see, I think, a significant uh, uh, ventures toward.
toward the planets anyway. Not the people so much, but I think they're going to... People maybe to pe People probably, I guess, in the next 20 or 30 years, we will send somebody back to the moon. I don't think there's a question about that. Mars is a little more difficult because what they're doing is on the space station, what they did with John Glenn to a degree, and other astronauts, you don't have to be in space very long before you lose bone density, uh, your heart gets weaker. The, the cosmonauts in the Mir space station are exercising two to three hours a day on a bicycle and treadmill and doing all sorts of things to keep the muscles from, from, from getting smaller. And when they come back to Earth, if you ever notice a cosmonaut, with, when you see cosmonauts, they can't stand up. Special uh, like underwear, they have uh, they have they pumps. It pumps pressure to your lower body to keep to keep it going because after a while the valves inside your body get very lazy and they will stop the flow of blood. I mean, you have valves in your body to keep the blood from going down your feet. So there are a lot. Of, one of the major things I forgot to mention this before you go anywhere for any long period of time will be the human body. We're very fragile and it's very expensive and what they're going to do on Space Station, once it gets up there, and it is spend a lot of time examining people, how long can you stay in space safely. A cosmonaut has stayed up there about a nine months or almost a year. So he, they have one, but I mean, no American has been up for more than like three months. Still, you know, it takes you 18, it's going to take, the round trip to Mars will be 18 months at the very best. Nine months out, the time there, nine months back, so. It's a very large issue. Any other questions? I went from a skin line. Yeah, it was for dinner tonight. Yeah. So, um, if you have any other questions, just ask her. She'll be glad to answer them. She did. We went down to, we went down to Cape last year. She was all thrilled about it, so she's now an expert. Yes? Oh, so three for you. I don't know if I can. <laughs> Uh, in some part of this, uh, your, your, your speech, you mentioned that uh, invest on uh, on NASA or NASA exploration would be a good would be good money. And in another part, you give an idea that perhaps company could re receive benefits from sure. investing this. Can you explain? Or okay, real real quick, because I don't have too much time. Uh, I studied economics by trade years ago, okay? Dollars spent in high-tech investments sometimes return a lot of money, not only to the company, but to the economy. It turns over and over and over again. It eventually ends up a dollar, but it ends up at McDonald's or Big Mac, I guess. But uh, there is money to be made in space, but a lot of it is, uh, we don't exactly know where or how. It's like the internet. By the way, I should, it should say one thing for my friends at the Defense Department. Internet, as probably most of you know, was in fact was in fact designed and developed by the United States military for for people to talk to one another. And the guy who one of the real founders was from Switzerland. I mean, it wasn't just army colonels doing this. But I uh, know there is money, and, and there's a tremendous. The way you find out is you look at companies that are willing to invest their money in, say, building a rocket or whatever it is, infrastructure, for example. And uh, there's money to be made there, and there's quite a few companies because you don't need a big rocket anymore to do that. And, and what drives it is just like building automobiles or anything else, it's cost. If you can develop it cheaply and do what customers want, uh, it'll work. And, and I think what we're seeing out there, and again, I'm just, I'm involved in some of the, working with some of the spaceports and launch vehicle companies, uh, is, um, the market's developing, and I, I'd say most of the, most launches today are not launched by the government. And it'll be happening more and more in the next several years. Uh, space shuttles will clearly be launched by the government, but um, the smaller smaller things will not be. So, you know, there's money to be made there. There, there clearly is. Yes, ma'am. Australia, New Zealand are wonderful places. We have the 200 miles. You did? Yeah. You're really trying.
related to this U.S. submarine ship. But, um... I'm very friendly to many things.